In this video, I'm going to cover the rate law. So in the last video, we learned that the rate is equal to the coefficient factor multiplied by the change in the concentration divided by the change in time. And depending on whether we're talking how many reactants we have or how many products we have, we can have A or B or C or D. And remember, they're all equal because we're taking into account how fast the concentration changes and um, the stoichiometric value, uh, whether I'm getting two molecules or three, what the ratio is in terms of um, reactant particles and product particles. So we know that the rate is equal to this value. But the rate is also equal to this value. K is a constant. This is what we call the rate constant. And N is called the order of the reaction. So if the rate is equal to this value, the changing in the concentration over the change in time, the rate is also equal to this value, uh, the rate constant times the concentration times the order of the reactant. So the exponent on each reactant in the rate law is called the order. So that's little n. So if we have more than one reactant, then I can draw a rate law that says that the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to its order times the concentration of B raised to its order times the concentration of C and M, O, raised to its order, and so on and so on. If there's lots of reactants, then we can have even more values in this, in this equation. So the exponent on each reactant, N, M, and O, is called the order. So N is the order with respect to A, M is the order with respect to B, and O is the order with respect to C. The sum of the exponents on the reactants is called the order of the reaction. So N plus M plus O equals N plus M plus O. This is the order of the whole reaction. This is N is the order with respect to A, and so on and so on. And then M plus N plus M plus O is the order of the whole reaction, depending on how many different reactants there are. So here is an example of an equation. Two NO plus 1O2 makes 2NO2. The rate law is second order with respect to NO, and it's first order with respect to O2. So in this case, N equals 2, and M equals 1. And the overall order is 2 plus 1 equals 3, third order overall. So this is little a, and this is little b, and this is little c, right? So little a equals 2, little b equals 1, and little c equals 2. So when we look at a rate law, we're not concerned with products. So first of all, I don't care about the products. When I'm talking about the rate in a rate law, I'm only talking about the reactants. So I need all of the reactants in the rate law um, and none of the products. And I need to make sure that I have the reactants, their concentration, and their order. And the, the, the order with respect to NO is 2. And the stoichiometric coefficient of NO is 2. So that happens to be the case here, that N and A are equal. But that is not necessarily true. Here, O, the, res the order with respect to O2 is 1. And the stoichiometric coefficient here for O2 in this reaction is 1. So this is a coincidence that 2 and 2 are equal, and 1 and 1 are equal. They are not necessarily the same thing. So let, we'll look at some other examples here. And I just want to point out that this is little n, and this is little m. 
and this is little a and this is little b and this is little c and little a does not necessarily equal little n and little b does not necessarily equal little m these are different this number the coefficient and this number the order they just are coincidentally the same in this reaction so let's look into some more examples Here's a reaction, CH3CN. So there's only one reactant. The stoichiometric coefficient is one, and the order here is one. Again, that's a coincidence. They happen to both be one, but that's not necessarily true for all of these. Here's another reaction. Um, there's only one reactant, so we only have one term in the rate law. The coefficient for this reactant is one, but the order of this reactant is three halves. So here's an example where those are not equal, one and three halves. They, they don't have to be equal. Sometimes they happen to be, but it's totally a coincidence. So it's okay if they're not equal, and in fact, a lot of times they will not be equal. Here's another one. I have a stoichiometric coefficient of two in front of this reactant, but the order of this reactant in the reaction is one, two, and one. They're not the same. H2 and I2 both happen to be one here. H2 and I2 both happen to be one here. That's a coincidence. Um, here I have uh, thallium ions and mercury, dimercury ions, because there's two of them here. And this one, the product does appear in the rate law. So this is really weird. And the reason that the product appears in this rate law is because the product actually affects how fast these two run into each other and not in just a physical way so we talked about the fact that products get in the way of the reaction when I have lots of products floating around then the reactants are much less likely to bounce into each other and so they're much less likely to have a reaction so the physical presence of products gets in the way of the reaction and slows it down that's true of all products and all reactions that's always true but this slows the reaction down in a different way, in an additional way. So it slows it down because it gets in the way, and it also slows it down because chemically, thallium and mercury um, have a coordination, an interaction with each other. So when I create more of this, then the thallium gets stuck to it. And so when the thallium is stuck to this, it can't react with the dimercury anymore, the monomercury and the dimercury. So um, we don't include products in the rate law because products don't affect the rate uh, in any special way except that their presence gets in the way of the reactants, right? But this one, we did include this product uh, because it says the bottom reaction is autocatalytic because a product affects the rate. H2, Hg2 plus is a negative catalyst and increasing its concentration slows the reaction down. So um, this is a strange reaction. This is strange, and it's strange because the product is affecting the reaction. None of these other reactions, the pro none of those products appear in the rate law because the rate of the reaction here is only a product of the uh, the reactant. The rate of this reaction is only a product of the reactant. The rate of this reaction only a product of the reactants. The rate of this reaction is a product of the reactants and one of the products. So this is um, an oddball. So w when we look at the fact that sometimes the stoichiometric coefficient is not equal to the order um, so, and whenever it is, it's totally a coincidence. It has nothing to do with them being related. Uh, that leads us to the conclusion that these orders always have to be determined experimentally. I can never look at a reaction and write the rate law. I can't do that. Because even though I think I can in this one, and I would say one, one, here's the rate law, one and one, you would be right, but you would only be right as an accident. You'd be accidentally right. You, you've, maybe you've heard the saying, even a broken clock is right two times a day, because if a clock isn't moving, at some point, whatever time it's stuck at, 
that time of day will come and go. So that broken clock is right two times a day. So if you happen to write the rate law and say the coefficients here are one and one, so then n and m must be one and one and you got it right, it would be an accident and that might work for you sometimes, but it won't work for you most of the time. So we can't just take these numbers from our written chemical reactions and plug them into our rate laws. We have, to dis we have to discover these numbers by running experiments and looking at data. The rate law must be determined experimentally. So um, we have to figure out how the rate is changing, and we do that by monitoring the concentration, like we talked about last time. The rate law shows how the rate of a reaction depends on the concentration of the reactants. Changing the initial, initial concentration of a reactant will therefore affect the initial rate of the reaction. If a reaction is zero order, so that means little n is equal to zero, then the rate of the reaction is always the same. So if I'm wondering what is the order of this reaction, and the idea is that if I change the concentration of A, I'm going to change the reaction because like we just said, if I have more um, reactant particles, they're going to bump into each other more often. So that assumption is only true if the order of the reaction is 1 or 2 or greater. If the order of the reaction is 0 and n equals 0, then what's A times 0 is equal to 1, right? Then K times 1 is equal to K. So then the rate of the reaction is equal to k, and a doesn't matter. If I change a, a can have any value, and any value raised to the zero power, zero power is going to be equal to 1. So it doesn't matter what the concentration of a is. The rate will always be the same in a zero-order reaction if n equals 0. If a reaction is first order, and little n equals 1, then the rate is directly proportional to the reactant concentration. So doubling A will double the rate of the reaction in that case. Um, and that makes sense because N is equal to 1. If I have 2 here, the concentration is 2, the rate is equal to something. If the concentration is 4, then the rate is twice as much. Double this, double this, because N equals 1. And if a reaction is second order and N equals 2, then the rate is directly proportional to the square of the reactant concentration. So that means if I double the concentration, this is 2 times faster, then it's 2 to the second power, so then it's 4 times, then the rate is 4 times faster. So every time I double the concentration, I'm increasing the rate by a factor of 4, because it's 2 raised to 2. So the order of the reaction depends on how the rate responds to changes in concentration. And we can see that written into this rate law right here. The rate is a function of the concentration raised to some power. So how do we determine the rate law when there's more than one reactant? If I just have one reactant, I can change the concentration of that one reactant and see how the rate changes. But what if I have A and B? How do I change the concentration of both of those and determine how that affects the rate? Well, if I just change the initial concentration of one reactant at a time, then the other one will stay constant. And so if I leave one reactant constant while I, ch while I double the other, for example, then if the rate changes and the rate doubles, then I know that the effect in the rate, the reason that the rate doubled, was because of the concentration I changed. If I double A and the rate goes twice as fast, and then I double B and the rate doesn't change at all, then I would say, oh, well then, the rate is changing because I'm doubling A, but the rate is not changing because I'm doubling B, that gives me information about the order of those reactants. That gives me information about the order of the reaction. And then I can write the rate law. So again, the rate law must be determined experimentally. It's not something I can just look at a chemical reaction and write. A graph of concentration of reactant versus time can be used to determine the effect of concentration on the rate of a reaction. So since a rate law must be determined experimentally, that means that I must have experimental data to look at when I'm trying to write a rate law. Um, generally, if we're trying to um, figure out an exact rate law by looking at a graph and I'm trying to determine the area under a curve, then there are ways to do that uh, using calculus. 
And so when, w when we look at this curve, the rate that we've looked at so far, change in A over change in T. Remember this, this uh, triangle is change in. This is delta. And so when we get to calculus, we can figure out a much more exact version of this equation by taking the integral dA over dt. And so if we um, take the integral of this value, then um, we can get a much, a much more accurate, a much more precise uh, number for this rate than just doing what we're doing in this class using an algebraic. This is using algebra to determine the area under the curve. And when we use calculus to determine the, the area under the curve, then we get a much more accurate um, representation. So in this class, we're not going to do that. We're not going to use calculus. We're going to keep our algebraic approach to uh, ca calculating rates. But when, you, when this does come up again in calculus class, then you have some kind of, you have at least an algebraic in where you can say, OK, I've, I've thought about this idea in terms of algebra before, how one thing changes as a function of another thing changing. Uh, and that's all the idea in calculus is. We're just looking at how one thing changes as another thing changes and what, the, what that looks like graphically. So here's a couple of graphs um, that have reactions of different orders. So this, on this uh, axis here, we have the concentration. Uh, this, and this reaction here is a really simple one. We have one reactant, and it goes to products. Just It doesn't matter what the products are, because remember, when we're talking about the rate law, we're, we're only concerned with the reactants. So we only have one reactant. So in a zero order reaction, and then you can see that as the time goes on, 0 to 20, I have this slope. And then from 20 to 40, I have the same slope. And then from 40 to 60, I have the same slope, because this is a straight line. And a straight line always has the same slope. So in a zero order reaction, I'm going to get a straight line, because it doesn't matter how much A I start with. If I have 100% A, I have this rate. If I have 80% A, I have the same rate. 60% A, same rate, same rate, same rate. The reaction always has the same rate, regardless of how much A I have. But these other curves follow the idea that we've talked about before, that intuitively makes sense, that if I have 100% reactant molecules, then at the beginning of the reaction, they're going to bump into each other at a lot higher frequency. And as I start to get down here, I'm at 50% reactant molecules. That means I have 50% product molecules now, too. And those 50% product molecules are getting in the way. And those reactant molecules can't hit each other as fast, so the reaction slows down. So at the beginning of the reaction, the initial rate is always faster for first order and second order reactions because I always the, there's no product molecules to get in the way. But for whatever reason on a zero order reaction, and we'll look at this more when we talk about mechanisms, in a zero order reaction, that idea is not important. So, and we'll look at why. It doesn't matter that, that, for whatever reason, the accumulation of products does not get in the way of slowing this one down. And the, having fewer reactants somehow does not get in the way of slowing this one down either. And we'll look at why. There's a mechanistic reason for that. So look, second order reactions slow down even faster than first order reactions do. And that makes sense because first order reactions the, they slow down because products start getting in the way and I start having less A, right? So if, I, if the only reaction is A, so here's an example of a first order reaction. A goes to B. So in a reaction like this, this doesn't even really involve a collision. A turning into B is because A is maybe uh, what we call decomposing. So maybe A consists of two parts. And then B is those parts separated. And so in this reaction, A doesn't even have to bump into anything. Something happens in this bond to break this bond apart, and then I have two B particles. So we can imagine when I have 100% A and all I have is A, 
then the likelihood that that bond is going to break is high. And then as I get less and less A, now the likelihood that that bond is going to break is lower because I have less of it. And eventually when I get down here to only have a few particles left, then it's, uh, it, on average, it takes a lot longer to break one of those bonds. I have a lot of bonds. On average, they, there's a lot of them broken every moment. And when I have fewer bonds, on average, there's less of them broken every moment. So that's how a first order reaction works. In a second order reaction, I have A plus B goes to C. So I have two particles that are trying to run into each other here in a second order reaction. And when A runs into B, um, then we can imagine at the very beginning, I only have A and B particles, so they'll run into each other more often. But as we get lower and lower and lower here, eventually those C particles start to get into the way, and there's less A and B, so an A might run into a C, or a B might run into a C, or A particles might run into each other, or B particles might run into each other, and that doesn't do anything. A has to run into B for the reaction to work. And by the time I get down here, that's less likely to happen. Down here in a first order reaction, this doesn't depend on running into anything. So it slows down, it doesn't slow down as fast. But this one, because A and B have to run into each other, that's kind of a rare event. So when there's a lot of A and B, it happens often, but when there's less A and B, it becomes less and less likely that they're going to run into each other. So the reaction slows down a lot faster. Second order reactions slow down faster than first order. So we can plot the, that same information, or we can plot the, those same reactions, except instead of plotting the change in concentration as a function of time, we can plot the change in rate as a function of concentration. So we see that information here already, because remember, the rate is the slope of the line. So what's the change in rate on the zero order reaction? It's nothing. The slope doesn't change at all, so the rate doesn't change at all. Well, here's another way of representing that. The rate doesn't change at all, so the rate is flat. It doesn't have any motion on this axis, so it's just flat in a zero order reaction. Doesn't matter what the concentration is, 0% A, all the way up to 100% A, the rate's always the same. So in a first order reaction, the way the rate changes as a function of A is that when I double the concentration of A, the rate goes twice as fast. If I have twice as many of these falling apart, they're going to fall apart twice as often. If I have four times as many of these falling apart, they're going to fall apart four times more often. So this is a linear relationship, the way the rate changes as the concentration changes. But in a second order reaction, it's exponential. So as the rate, uh, as the concentration of A changes, the second order rate is far more um, sensitive to the change in A. We can see here that a change, a doubling of A from 0.2 to 0.4 has a change in the rate that is uh, a small slope. And then from 0.4 to 0.6, that rate is getting faster, the same change. And then I add another 0.2, and the rate goes even faster, the change in the rate. And I add another 0.2, and it goes even faster. So what that means is that zero order reactions are not sensitive to changes in concentration at all. First order reactions are sensitive to changes in concentration. And for every time I double the concentration, I double the rate. It's linear. And second order concentrations are exponential. Every time I double the concentration, I quadruple the rate. If I quadruple the concentration, then the rate goes up by a factor of 16. So it's exponential because the value of this exponent is 2. See, that's the only thing that's changing here. 